This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. The following is being brought to you by Remote Transcription. This morning, our guest speaker is an international broadcaster, Vern Benham Grimsley. Thank you and good morning. In case you're curious about these extra microphones, we are tape recording this for possible use on the broadcast. If all goes well this morning, this will later be heard in Europe, Asia, Africa, Stockton, Fresno, <laughs> possibly as far south as San Jose. I'm going to lecture today on the subject spiritual dynamics. That word dynamics is from the same root as our word dynamo, which is from the Greek dynamis, or power. Nearly a century ago, the French writer Renan made this prediction. I predict that the 20th century will spend a good deal of its time picking out of the wastebasket things which the 19th century threw into it. There is a vital process contemporarily of rediscovering the validity of spiritual things spiritual values, and rediscovering the power of the spirit and the incredible impact of faith in God, both upon the individual and upon civilization. The great English physicist Michael Faraday, with nothing but a piece of steel and some insulated copper wire, created a small toy-like device which was the first working dynamo. It was capable of generating electricity when spun. But one time when he was demonstrating his discovery before a group of men and women, a lady inquired of him, but what good is this little toy? To which Michael Faraday replied by asking, Madam, what is the use of a newborn baby? Faraday's electrical plaything is now in worldwide use as a source of power and light on every continent. Similarly, Alexander Graham Bell despaired at his inability to interest commercial investors in backing his new invention, the telephone. Somehow, most people could not visualize what would one day become a fantastic network of intercommunication worldwide. So, too, does it require both faith and a far-sighted spiritual vision to begin to conceive the incredible potentials of a new age of religious truth upon this war-bled planet. Within each one of us, and about each one of us, lie an amazing array of possibilities. God has a will and wisdom for each of us, and the dynamics of faith release our soul-bound energies of mind and spirit and personality, that we then begin truly to live as the infinitely valuable sons and daughters of God we were born and created to be. A certain poet there was who had taken a large sheaf of his writings to the office of a great publisher, and as the publisher sat and read them, he squinted his eyes and his brow wrinkled, and finally the publisher said, your handwriting is so garbled and indistinct, I can hardly read these poems of yours. He said, why didn't you type them before you brought them in to me? To which the poet replied, do you think I'd waste my time writing poetry if I could type? <laughs> Such is one viewpoint of religion, that it's something you do if you're too incompetent to do anything else that faith is something you have when you don't have anything any better. True, much evolutionary historic religion is founded upon falsehood. On the island of Santorin, there is a small stone chapel now known as the Chapel of St. Nicholas, but which archaeologists say is actually over 2,300 years old, and before being used as a Christian chapel, it was originally a pagan sanctuary of the ancient Greek religion. There is much symbolic truth in that archaeological fact. Many a modern religious belief rests on an ancient and crumbling pagan foundation. For example, the doctrine that God is ill-tempered and wrathful, or that God's anger is not appeased until a blood sacrifice is offered, the concept that God hates sinners. All of these are ancient pagan doctrines which are to be found in the earliest and most fear-founded superstitions of the human race, and yet which many still believe but which must be rejected by the advanced and enlightened religion of the future, which must center on the experiences of truth, beauty, and goodness, and culminating in love, love for God and love for others. I can no more think of God 
without thinking of God's loving goodness than I can think of an emerald without its greenness, nor a ruby apart from its redness, nor the ocean apart from its wetness. So it is the very nature of God is goodness and is love. And to know God is to know the greatest source of reality and goodness in the universe. But it is not only an idea one can believe, it is a truth one can experience. And that is the vital aspect of it. Spiritual progress is difficult. There may be momentary confusions along the way. But if your purposes are clear, both your direction and your destiny are assured. Suppose you're driving along in your car on a long cross-country trip and you're listening to the radio. One of your choices is whether to listen to stations behind you, stations in towns and cities from which you're driving away, or listening to stations ahead of you. Trying to stay tuned to a station you're going away from is a losing cause. It will eventually fade out. Better, when possible, to tune to a station toward which you are driving. I have had the experience, particularly when traveling long distances at night, of hearing the station to which I'd been listening fade out and a new one begin to fade in at precisely the same place on the tuning dial. And during the moments between, you find yourself tuned in to two competing signals. Such is the problem of human consciousness. Each human being lives attuned to two signals, the urges of the electrochemical physical body and the higher beckonings of the spirit. Human beings are not only part of the natural world of time and space. In some ways, human beings transcend that world. Now, the most perplexing experience of human confusion can come in the conflicting reception of these two simultaneous inputs. But if you determinedly persist in moving toward the forward ideal of spiritual progress, if the momentum of your aspirations and decisions are toward the vision of perfection, then those things which are behind will in time begin to fade, and the clear leadings of the spirit will begin to dominate mind and soul and life. The regrets, failures, guilty memories of a far from perfect past then begin to fade in impact and importance as you follow the forward goal of perfection ahead. Authentic faith is not a substitute for intelligent effort, but an augmentation of effort. In Scotland, a group of tourists were out on a lake when a squall came up, and the sudden winds threatened to capsize the boat. Terrified by the crisis, the biggest and strongest man in the party cried out to his companions, let us pray. To which the boatman yelled, no, let the little fellow over there pray, you grab an oar. <laughs> Faith and prayer are never substitutes or replacements for action. They are, in fact, stimuli and instigators of dynamic action. Faith mobilizes all your energies for the task of living and carrying forth the purposes of God. When you're out driving on the road, if you have a flat tire, ponder the fact anyone with average muscular strength can take a car jack that weighs 10 pounds and lift up an automobile weighing thousands of pounds. Faith, similarly, is an astonishing kind of spiritual leverage. It is an expression of spiritual power. Jesus said faith can move mountains, and history has shown time and again that one man or woman of faith can influence and uplift the life of a whole city, a state, or a nation. The most sure and certain technique for the transformation of the world is the transformation of the individual, a spiritual renaissance in the lives of men and women, and in this is gladness and joy. For there are higher realities in this universe than the merely material. There is a noble and timeless perspective in the realization that the ultimate purpose and destiny of life is spiritual. I remember reading that after political terrorists assassinated the Italian leader Aldo Moro, someone scrawled this sentence to the terrorists on a wall near where Moro's body was found. It read, you can no longer kill what you have made immortal. There is comfort, strength, and solace in the recognition of the truth that eternity is real and that the final assessment of human life and history are encompassed in the mind and the will of a just and loving God whom to know and to serve is a source of abiding strength and peace like a river and joy like a running stream. 
It is fascinating to note that Webster's Dictionary defines that word, joy, in the following fashion, quote, joy, the emotion excited by the acquisition or expectation of good. Here is a vital distinction. Evil may momentarily provide pleasure, but the source of higher happiness, joy, is in the good. Joy is spiritual in origin and nature, and its ultimate experience is the experience of the love of God. A young man, just before he was to leave for the university, became convinced of the reality of spiritual things and set forth determined to share the light of truth with his classmates. But after his first few weeks among the skeptics and the doubters he found on campus, he wrote home to the old man who was his spiritual advisor and said, I'm desperate. It seems that all my classmates are doubters. How can I prove to them that God is real? And the answer came back in the mail, just live for three months as if he were. And three months later, there came back a letter with just two words on it, it works. One way to understand faith is to see it as living as if. Faith is assuming truth and then acting on that assumption. Remember, wherever you are, wherever you may be, whatever your situation in life, you stand at the beginning. This moment of your life is the end of the old and the beginning of the new, because a beginning is where you begin it. It is a simple decision. A song is yours when you decide to sing it. A smile is yours when you decide to smile it. Greater faith is yours the moment you decide to use it. A fresh beginning isn't just something that happens to you, it's something that you do. Everything awaits decision. God loves you now, the kingdom of God is within you now. Thus a beginning is where you begin it. And all eternity stretches forth before the place of here and now at which you stand this moment. And by faith, you can enter the Father's future with joy and unafraid. The preceding has been brought to you by Remote Transcription. If you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address. SRI Box 3080, Oakhurst, O A K H U R S T, California, C A L I F O R N I A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? If you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation. Nobody's going to come to your door with an attache case and try to sell you something. Simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute Box, 3080 Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.